So hello and welcome to Walk the Talk, our version of a podcast where you walk if you want to while we do the talking. So if you're up for it, plug in your earphones and listen while you take us on a walk. So use the next 45 minutes to move your body and feed your mind. My name is Sarah and I'm one of the co-founders and trainers at Point Three Wellbeing and I'll be hosting today's Walk the Talk conversation. The next in our series aimed at HR professionals, business leaders and those interested in mental health and well-being of people in the workplace. And I'm delighted today to be joined by our panel of international women for our special International Women's Day edition of Walk the Talk, focused on imagining a gender equal workplace. So this is an opportunity to celebrate achievements of women, but perhaps more importantly, it's also a call to action to accelerate women's equality. Whether deliberate or unconscious, there is still much bias to break down. And there is much that we collectively need to do to ensure um, that our workplaces are inclusive, diverse, equitable, and offer a level playing field for women. So this is a conversation and a chance to discuss how we can break down the bias by sharing what's working and what needs to be improved. Before we move into today's conversation, I would like to send our collective thoughts and prayers to all the women and indeed all the people of Ukraine fleeing or fighting for their survival, never mind fighting for their rights. So today's conversation is for them and for all women around the world, wherever they are and whatever their plight. Okay, I will shortly ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, but welcome in the first instance to Mickey Maruko. Uh, Mickey is a business mentor and life coach for female entrepreneurs and lives and works in Switzerland. We also have Yurata Pojakaita, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, Chief Marketing Officer and Chief Chief Data Officer at My Loyal, uh, who lives and works in Copenhagen. And Niru Desai, Chief Marketing Officer from CO2 Hero, also coincidentally living and working in Copenhagen. Now I'm personally connected to each of today's panelists and have worked with you all and I'm incredibly proud and privileged that I have the chance to have this conversation with you today. So all three international women are unconnected until now, but they're women who share just some of the following in common. They've all reached senior executive levels in their respective fields. They have also all chosen to live and work around the world in various different countries and cultures over their lifetime. And finally, they're all bringing up future generations of women and are rightly passionate about what the future holds for them. So perfect credentials for today's conversation. So let's get started. Firstly, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and to share how you identify, whatever that means to you. So first up, Mickey. Delighted to have you here today, Mickey. Thanks for having me here, Sarah. Um, Yeah, so as your slide rightly says, I'm a business mentor and life coach for female entrepreneurs. And I basically support female coaches and professionals to achieve success and grow their business in a way that is aligned with who they are and is sustainable for their desired lifestyle. So, and I personally identify as an Asian woman Um, I have been living by choice in a predominantly Western society and and have been living outside of Asia for the last 30 years. Thank you. Welcome, Mickey. I'm now going to hand over to Yurata. Welcome, Yurata. Thank you. First of all, thanks, Sarah, for inviting to discuss such an important topic. 
Uh, about myself, I'm a CMO uh, working at a Danish software company uh, here in uh, Copenhagen. And uh, I spent over 15 years working in the tech industry in the corporate, uh, on the corporate side. Last two years, I moved into the startup world, uh, again, in the tech industry. And uh, definitely in, in the industry I am, the, it's still very much a male predominant industry. Therefore, this topic and uh, bringing the awareness about the gender equal workplace is super important for, about, uh, for me. Um, about myself, I have two kids, um, six years old girl and two years old, two and a half years old boy. I lived for a long time and worked in London, uh, Norway, and for the last seven years, I've been living in Denmark. And the most important thing, I'm Lithuanian. So uh, I've been a foreigner outside of my own country for the last 12 years. Well, welcome, Yurata. And finally, but not least, Niru, welcome. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, ladies. Uh, looking really forward to this uh, conversation. Um, and you know, when the, I was going through the notes themselves, you have to identify you know, yourself. I actually found it the hardest, the one that I got stuck on, because um, if you see me, uh, it, and it's great to have a slide, it has your title there. I can talk about the company CO2 Hero, which is a climate app, the startup as well. Yes, I live in Denmark. But it's a very fluid, uh, I guess, identity map that I have to draw on. Um, when I say I'm Danish, it stops everyone. Uh, Sarah knows from the past, it's been a conversation in the pubs. Go, no, 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 where are you really from? And I think to Jurassic's point that it seems like I'm a, a global citizen. It's really hard to say where home is. I have very strong ties to my origin, which is uh, Indian. Uh, but you know, I was brought up in Denmark. So it's the belongingness gets even stronger when you're away from a certain home. And when I was in London, I was always from Denmark. Now I'm back in Denmark. I've lived most of my life in London. It's, uh, you're always in the state of confusion. And you know, I think it's very important that it's a very fluid way that we identify ourselves with. I also think that's really key about being the role of a woman. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a mom to a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, I'm a wife to a Canadian a husband who's also Indian origin. Uh, I'm a daughter. I've got my parents here and I play different roles. And then I'm a sister as well, as well as I'm leading uh, a team, uh, marketing, communicating about climate change, you know, so I have to wear these different hats. And it's, it's very interesting, this, uh, especially current, uh, you know, today and yesterday, there's a lot of congratulations for juggling lots of hats and roles, but sometimes you step back and think, who am I really? So it's a very hard question to answer, but I just say, I think I juggle lots of hats. I, I think something that kind of I could probably recap would be I'm the planner mostly, be at home, be it outside. I see my, my role as thinking ahead and what are the things that need to be in place. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I love that global citizen as well. Um, but I, I, I agree. I think sometimes it can be really hard. And, you know, who am I? Well, we're changing every day, aren't we? Um, and that's exciting as well. Well, welcome, ladies. Um, so diving straight in. And the mission of International Women's Day is to promote inclusive work cultures where women's careers thrive and their achievements are celebrated. So I'd love to hear from each of you, your perspective and experience, your personal experiences when it comes to this mission of an inclusive workplace culture um, and how close you believe we are to achieving this, what you've learned from your own experiences, the good and the bad, uh, when it comes to workplace cultures that you've played a part of. And I'm going to come to you first, Yurata, um, principally because back in um, when we worked together in 2011, I think it was, well, that's when I first actually came across International Women's Day. And one of our male colleagues left a tulip on each of our desks. And it's a Scandinavian tradition to recognise women on International Women's Day. Um, so that was when I, it first um, came on my radar. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Yurata, on, uh, on this mission for International Women's Day and your own experiences. 
Yeah, um, definitely it's a subject uh, where we need to talk about that more. And I think I feel also in um, the industry where I am uh, for the last many years, um, this subject became more and more relevant and discussed and um, recognized. Um, talking about International Women's Day and the mission, uh, definitely uh, something which uh, is very important to me. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of flowers on the Women's Day because I don't think a person should be defined by gender. Um, different people, different values, but definitely gender is not the one which should define um, who the person is. Uh, but coming back to the workplace, it's um, it's in the industry of, in the tech industry. It's only one out of five of employees are females, and it's even less in the management. Um, therefore, if we say okay, we're there, we are not there yet. Uh, are we on the right track? Uh, yes, we are. And I guess it's down to every person uh, to look around um, and say, do I live those values? Uh, because we as humans, we tend to surround ourselves with the people who are similar to us. And it's great uh, to surround your friends who are similar to you. But the work, in order to be efficient and have a happy workplace, you have to make sure you have a good balance. Uh, and either it's gender, ethnicity, or any other uh, bias, it just has to be a balanced uh, workplace. And um, some Funny stories I experienced. It was uh, when I was in London. Uh, I was telling to you, Sarah, yesterday. It was uh, a management meeting, and um, all country management directors uh, joined, and I joined the meeting. And the CXO at that time, he was opening the meeting and was like, "Hello, gentlemen." And he looked at me because I was only one female in the room. Um, and then he was confused and was like, "And you're at it," because he was just not used to seeing females in the room. Um, so those kind of situations I experience a lot. Uh, therefore, I think it is my role as well to bring awareness and bring more females, uh, especially to the teams. And in the last three jobs, when I started, I either joined a 100% male team or I started managing the team who was 100% male. And I was shocking every time, still in 2022, still shocking. Um, and it's our job to make the change and uh, talk about it and uh, not to have a different view of why gender should be any different than any other um, thing. But I've been lucky in my career having an amazing managers uh, who helped me to climb the ladder, uh, face and solve some issues uh, I was facing. So I, I've been lucky uh, because I had a wonderful managers who later became my mentors and who never really defined me as a person uh, based on my gender. Well, lots there. Thank you, Yurata. Um, and hopefully we'll unpack some, some of that throughout uh, this morning's conversation. So coming to you now, Nero, what can you add from your own perspective and experiences? Yeah, I think uh, Yurata brought, brought up many, uh, many important points. I think it's true that, and it's also one of those where you, International Women's Day comes and you want to celebrate, but you also are a bit like, well, why is it just today? Why is it not every day? And we, and at, in the team we have uh, at CO2 Hero, we do say we celebrate you every day, but you know, we got to give you a shout out uh, because that's one day that we as women as a network can also really rise and, you know, be, be proud of what has been achieved. But also, I think, identify the many gaps that are still there. Um, and as every, and you know, us being in the marketing background, that there's always going to be a hashtag that comes out this year was break the bias, right? And I was like, okay, break the bias. We've got to stick that on everything. Let's, and then I was like, stop, stop, stop. When we are talking about the bias, yes, it's more than just gender. And I think your point in this conversation is it's, it's not just in gender, it's about inclusivity. Are we including you at the right time, the right moment, the right way. Um, in the journey I've had, I've, uh, as I said, I've, I, I was away from, I've been working in London. I worked across, uh, I rose from professional services in the banking industry, uh, in the marketing, very strategic kind of thinking to into events. Very male dominated and events industry still have many women, but on the managerial, I guess, on the 
top leadership positions and men. Um, again, I was very lucky to have uh, management and seniors who saw my potential and gave me the platform to rise in that. What is interesting to see is I can actually, and these are certain key stories that have made an impact on me. And I think it's something I also wanna make my daughter aware of is, uh, remember that you don't need to change yourself to fit into something to be accepted. Unfortunately, I have lots of experiences where female seniors have tried to shape me in a way to say, then you won't be accepted if you carry on this way in terms of you've got long hair, you're not wearing glasses, you don't look older, you don't look as serious, you know, you're very fashionable, but maybe you got to tone it down. All these little petty things were, and it doesn't have to be true for the other late, I mean, women on this call or who are listening in, but I've found a lot of times historically for me, it's been the senior women who have found a very hard way to get up the ladder and felt that they've tried to say, if you do these changes, fit more into what that table looks like, you're going to be accepted. Um, and I think I'm definitely now in a, in a level where I've had experience maturity. And I think there are certain things that women just through the pure nature of this, the role that we take on during life, like I told you, the planner, the thinking ahead, the juggling many things, there's softer elements that are as important and I believe can do a bigger impact and bring other values that have been missing in a business. So I think we need to start to appreciate those and we need to make space to allow for those to grow as well um, and not keep rewarding the achievements that historically have been what men have, you know, in the past been congratulate, great, you know, revenues up, great, you did the sales um, and stop other women feeling that there's a marcher or, you know, you have to give up something to achieve something. Uh, so that I think from an experience point of view and from, uh, when we're looking at the mission of the International Women's Day this year, I think it's so important to start to make everybody feel comfortable in the skin they are, but also believe that you don't have to change yourself to fit into that table. And um, I, I'm a very big fan of a, a very humor and light, and there's so much great material going around content. So I've been constantly listening and that uh, there was a Lily Singh uh, TED Talk, 20 minutes. She's a comedian, a stand-up comedian, Asian uh, heritage as well, American. and. Uh, she was talking about the table itself, you know, saying, you know, we're congratulating women leaders. There's a lot about women leaders, right? So this the perception, this push, this pressure about reaching to the top and getting a seat at this table. She said the table itself is wrong in the first place, <laughs> you know, that's existing there. And she said, and most of the time we're the ones, so the women in the workplace devote more than 10% or so, it's a number they've given time to, uh, invest in creating more inclusive and um, open environment for those conversations, a sustainable environment, climate focus as well, um, which are not rewarded for. Hmm. So the actual table has been provided by these women who've been fighting for it. But once they get on the table, they have to fit on a chair that actually doesn't fit them properly. Or they're given a chair that is yet to be proven. So you, you're gonna get a straw chair and you won't get a proper chair until you prove your point. You know, if you're not going to give them the proper chair to sit on and the potential and the opportunity and let them be themselves, I think they're not going to last yeah. at the table. Um, and then the fact, and I thought it was a very nice symbolic, she said, and also make sure you have enough chairs around mm -hmm. because a lot of times there's that one chair and one woman is trying to sit on another woman's chair. And it's, there's a lot of still hidden biases within our women community. Yeah. I was trying to prove, no, but I did so much more harder than you. And I've got two children and you don't. And why should you be, give, you know? So I think we just need to relook that table arrangement. Redefine the, the table plan. Yeah. And yeah. the table. Look at the materials, look at the layout. <laughs> um, okay. And, well, there's lots again there. And we're going to touch more on some of that um, as we come, come through. Um, Turning to you, please, Mickey, now, can you share some of your personal experience and perspective on, on where we are and where we, we've come and, and what we need to, to still do? Yes, I think, um, you know, as uh, Nira and Yurati have obviously said, you know, we've made 
huge advances already in the past few decades in terms of opportunities in the workplace and being paid fairly. And I think the difficulty has always been, and, and Nira spoke to this, is how we can recognize that women are equal and different to men, right? So I think in the past, it's always been women almost trying to fit into that male mold and the structures that men have set up for, you know, historically, whereas now actually the structures or this, you know, the table has to change and has to look very differently. So I think there we are getting closer to embracing women as they are and finding ways that both feminine and masculine energy can be helpful for organizations. Um, and what we're learning as women also is how to honor who we are and be authentic um, and allowing that to come through and not thinking that we have to be someone else. Um, and, I, you know, I think that we as women struggle with that just because of the historical fact that we're trying to fit into a different mold. Mm -hmm. um, to do this, though, you do have to first understand who you are, mm -hmm. right? And I think Nir spoke to this before. It's like, as women, our identities are shifting throughout our lifetime so much more than, than men go through. And so it is trying to understand at any stage, who am I, what am, what's important to me? What are my values? What do I stand for? And oftentimes it's not something that we stop to ever question or ever think about in the first place. So you can't be yourself if you don't even know who you are to begin with. Um, and uh, yeah, so for my in my industry where I am right now, I think it's an exciting time because there's never been more opportunities, um, you know, in you know in recent history for women to create um, and grow their own successful business, like there is right now in this sort of post-pandemic or you know era where th the world has gone online. Um, women can basically use the skills that they have to to create a successful business. And so what I see um, in this space is that these women are having to find how to do that in a non-masculine way, mm -hmm. right? So how to, to create a business in, in the way that allows um, all their feminine energy to come through and not just create a business as a man would have done, you know, 20, 20 years ago. Brilliant. Okay, well, let's explore this a little bit more, this idea of who am I identity, um, however we we define that for ourselves. And we're, you know, that is a difficult place to start, but also how we tie that um, identity with our sense of belonging. Um, again, we, we've, we've talked about this and, and how the two um, come together to impact on our on our mental health and well-being, um, how we think, feel, and behave, because that in itself will go on to determine how much we can then thrive in in the workplace. So it's a big question, but I'm going to direct, direct this to you, Nero, to start with. Um, when we worked together, I recall you you wrote an insights paper drawing on Maslow's hierarchy of of needs. Um, and how we can use this as a framework to, to create positive experiences for people. Um, of course, here we're talking, the positive experience we're talking about is in, uh, about creating this inclusive workplace where people feel like they belong. And belonging is very much part of that hierarchy as, as, long as, as well as having the basics in place, food, shelter, safety. Um, but exploring this idea of, of belonging what can you share to help bring this to life when we think about identity, whether that's gender or or other, um, and this sense of belonging in the workplace to enable people, and particularly women in the context of today's conversation, to, to really thrive at work? Um, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, when I'd written that paper, I think, uh, I mean, math will be math, but I think it was the idea that we really need to start to understand needs. And uh, there are certain basic needs, and as you move up, they get a bit more complicated. It's also this head-to-heart connection. You know, you're moving from emotive, sorry, from logical to more, you know, rational thinking to more emotive. And you know, how do we do that? 
um, and you have to satisfy each need as you move up the level. And you're right, the fact that uh, how are we going to create this belongingness? How are we going to create this uh, self-esteem and self-actualization for these women? Uh, and what we still do in workplace, I think, is we're doing the same thing as Master was saying, and, and we were speaking in our previous life, Sarah, when we're talking about event journeys, is we skip a lot of those needs. And we expect them already to feel valued because we've given you a great title. We've given you, you know, remuneration. Why are you not feeling up that level? And actually there are a lot of basic needs that still haven't been fulfilled. And I think uh, I'm commendable, like, you know, just point three in that too, that, you know, yes, we're great. We, we focus on health, how we look outside and that, but the mental health is a big part of who we are and also of how we interact with others and how we grow ourselves. So the actual basic psychological need, which sits at the bottom of that pyramid, totally makes sense to also stop in a workplace and think, have we created a space uh, that, and I think uh, I'm gonna use Mickey's point that I love the fact that being authentic, right? Are you allowing them to be themselves? Uh, are you making them retro, you know, fit into something that already exists? Uh, have you asked them what their current situation, and this is, it could be someone joining in and the first perception could be, oh, she's a young mom. That means there's going to be a lot of days she might have to have sick leave and that instead of taking it the other way around saying, okay, she's a young mom, but that means that she might be busy this, this time, but maybe she's open for more later, even once a kid has, she still wants to develop herself. So maybe she works great for an, a US project deal that could be long. You know, it's just about making sure once you're entering at the psychological need, have you understood the mindset of your new employer, the, the, uh, the female uh, candidates that are coming in the door or the existing ones that are there? As we move up about, it's about safety and stability, but I, I think it's this fact that you wanna, of course, constantly, as, and as we said, we keep shifting our roles, are they still feeling valuable? And it doesn't mean that giving them a shout out and clap on once a year or, you know, great, you know, women leader of the year um, awards, but it's also making them not feel this whole FOMO, fact, you know, oh, you're going to take off a year for having a kid, fear of missing out, you know, there might be others like, you know, climbing up that ladder before you then, or by the way, um, just not because if you're not a mom or you don't have a partner, still, there's not, there's other valuable things that we can then provide them and make them feel safe and stable and appreciated. Um, and as, and I think the next level is about the whole social belongingness where we're talking about and connections. Now, I think that is a huge area where, and I love the fact that as women, we're all networking, you know, we're, we're inspiring each other. Um, this belongingness of being, feeling part of the workplace being happy in your own skin, but also, you know, that have they created the right time and place for me to allow those connections to happen? Uh, we've all heard the term of the boys club. Um, and I think I'm, uh, you know, I'm thankful for, and I think you are talking about saying, I think Denmark definitely and is perceived as a very egalitarian society. Uh, you know, uh, the infrastructure, the, the policies here, you know, women can uh, come back to work after having children because of the subsidized childcare. So they understand that unlike the UK where there's a lot of part-time moms coming back, it's full-time mom mostly that is the majority that come back to work because that's really important for the, I guess the professional, but also mental health of the women to, mm -hmm. you know, feel that they're not just developing as a mom, as a new mom, but also workplace if they choose to be. Uh, but that said, there's still a hidden bias, you know, uh, it's true if we look around even in the Nordics, a lot of the, I guess the top level execs have a certain color, gender, age, you know, uh, so it still exists even in the most sophisticated egalitarian societies. And I think that's really important to start to think about when we talk about connections in this day and age where we have technology that can help to connect people. Uh, you know, you can have finally post COVID, I think it was really hard without having the live engagement. You can meet up with people, you can have those conversations. Um, how do we create these ongoing connections that will grow and not just for a hoo-ha out there? 
Um, and then I think the final step is, you know, once people feel that they're being valued, they feel that there's a connections there, there's support there, there's a safety net there. It's a self-actualization. Now that one I thought was a bit difficult when we think about, it, because again, it depends on the women, you know, where they are in this, in their life, uh, what they see themselves as their role being. But I think it all ties in with growth. Are we, are we giving them the platforms, the seeds to grow that allows them to be happy mentally as well and stronger as well and therefore also inspire others to grow. So uh, there's a lot of different and I think Sarah when you when you did mention that I said God there's so many different ways to look at this and I think yeah. it's a personal way but but I think it's a good conversation starter Absolutely. to look in your workplace and tick you know do we have something there do we have something there maybe not we can't do everything but let's try to at least put a few different uh, triggers in the place so that we can support uh, the growth of women at workplace. Thank you. And we're going to come to talk some more about what um, we can do um, moving forward to, to take positive action because it's one thing having the conversation, but but we want to be moving moving forward. So we, we've touched on um, belonging, and we've also touched on this idea of fitting in and. Um, so I'm going to come to you, Mickey, if I may, um, and I'm going to quote Brené Brown, um, and she talks about the difference between uh, belonging and fitting in. Belonging is being accepted for you, and fitting in is being accepted for being like everyone else. So how do you relate to this, and what have you learnt about yourself and from your experiences in the workplace, but also with the women that you coach, that you can share with others today? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as, as Nira was saying, like we do all have a fundamental need to feel like we are, be that we belong and are accepted. Um, and there is, um, the reality is that there is often the pressure to fit in or to think that if we, that by fitting in, we will belong. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think part of what organizations have to struggle with is is how to allow people as you know we've spoken up before is, um, to be themselves and to be valued for who they are and feel that they can belong and fit in as who they are rather than change who they are or uh, hold back on who they are in order to fit in mm -hmm. um, because they can be the same thing I think um, and I think so one of the things that I think organizations can do to, to capitalize on this is to um, is to really articulate, you know, their values and their purpose and their vision in a way that allows everyone to rally around that and to identify with that as a community. Um, and, uh, you know, and you can do that right from, you know, before someone even joins the organization so that you can see, are they, you know, are they someone who's going to feel like they can belong as who they are? Is this an organization that they want to be a part of, mm -hmm. regardless of how they identify on a superficial level? So, you know, on the very fundamental human level of gender, ethnicity, age, all of that. But at a very at a deeper level, more spiritual level, um, there is that opportunity for people to feel that they are connected. Um, I guess for me personally, I've learned that the more you know who you are, as I've said already, the more that you know your unique strengths, um, the easier it is actually to belong and be appreciated and accepted for who you are. And I think one of the difficulties, um, you know, I started working in corporates in the financial services sectors in my early 20s. And I think at that age, we're still developing our sense of who we are. And so you enter these organizations and it is very difficult to take that stand of this is who I am because it's still very fluid. You, you may not really know who you are. Um, and so I guess one of the questions is, you know, what role does an organization have in terms of helping women um, or people, you know, just generally youth, I think, come into their organizations and, develop who they are um, and allow room for, for that personal growth um, as well as professional growth. Yes, thank you. I love that, um, you know, this sense of, of understanding our own, on our own values. I think that's a really important place 
to start. Um, so in the interest of time, um, uh, I'm going to move um, and, and come to you, Yurata. Um, we, we know there is much work to, to still do to bring equality uh, into the workplace in areas of gender pay gap, female representation at senior levels, to name a couple of the, the, one, the most talked about. Um, but a report last year by McKinsey in, in the US um, said that while women have made important gains in representation, especially at senior leadership levels, women are now significantly more burnt out and increasingly more so than men. Um, and I'd be keen to, to hear your thoughts on this, especially you, you hold a C-suite position and we have a lot of business leaders and HR professionals on, on the call. What do you think organisations can do to bring more equality into the workplace and to set women up to, to thrive rather than to burn out? Yeah, it's um, as Nira mentioned. I mean, Denmark is is quite ahead on that uh, on bringing the equality uh, into the the work. But it's still, if you look at the a top management position, it's still very much uh, male dominant. And I was looking at the data a couple of days ago uh, in Europe and uh, even in the Nordics. It's still there's thirteen percent pay gap difference between men and female. And, and, and that's in 2022 is still shocking because even the 1% difference is shocking because why there should be any difference in, in there. And I guess it's down to every person or every business manager who has employees to make sure that doesn't happen. And then for HR to help to facilitate those discussions. And uh, I've been a manager for many years. And of course, I hear a lot of things like, oh, she didn't ask. Um, while the man asked, I was like, okay, but it's our job to help people to be open and transparent and self-confident to ask, um, or a female have to leave for one year because of maternity leave. And in Denmark, it's, uh, we are very lucky that we can come back full time 10, 12 months after, uh, and don't feel guilty about that because of amazing system around us. Um, but it's, um, it's a thing where you need to each, I think each manager with the help of HR needs to bring in that topic about how much we've done to bring more self-confidence to the females. And also been mentoring um, young talents and young female talents. Um, and when they start a career, um, they hold themselves a little bit more than when um, a young guy starts. And still the fact and as a females, we need to support them um, in bringing self-confidence uh, and making sure that the perfection is not the main goal, is being belonging, uh, delivering, in, and gender should not define who you are. And I guess it's, it's me, I never define myself who I am based on the gender. And that helps me um, to bring up the topics which are relevant for me uh, and say, well, I have to leave. I have to pick up kids and bring it up forward before I actually uh, get a job and say, well, I have to go. Um, and don't feel guilty about that. But it takes years to get that self-confidence, not to feel guilty uh, to do something what it's super important for you outside work. Um, and I always keep uh, to keep a balance uh, for females. It's still hard. Um, I guess it's even more harder in other countries than it is in Denmark. But what helped me personally uh, to do is one is extreme planning of my and my husband's calendars. It's like to the details. We know what will happen. Um, so I could tell in advance I can't join that meeting because I have a commitment. Um, and the second thing is um, set yourself the boundaries uh, of when it's you work, when you need to spend time uh, being with kids. So I have strict rules that five to eight, I don't work. I'm available after 8 p.m., but five to eight is a kid's time. So having these rules helps to keep a balance and still be a successful at work because you don't feel you're female or something else. Um, you just perform your work well, 
However, you keep what's important uh, important and be vocal about that and not to be afraid to talk about that because a lot of females I see around, they're afraid to say that, okay, I have a sick kid. I have to leave because I have to pick up because it's my day. Uh, but as long as you do a great planning, uh, these things really never came up on uh, as a challenge for anyone. So each of us have to do a lot to help other females, uh, especially at young age, uh, to bring that self-confidence on talking about those things. So extreme planning and boundaries, I love that. But picking up on that point on, on confidence and coming to you, Mickey, as a coach to, to female entrepreneurs, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and the conversations you're have, having with, um, with your clients around confidence. Um, I know it's a big subject in itself, imposter syndrome, but, um, you know, are, are these the topics that are coming up? How are you... Um, helping women um, with, with confidence um, and any sort of top line advice for, for anyone experiencing this themselves? Yes, I mean, I think um, confidence and imposter syndrome is something that affects women at all stages of business um, or in their careers in some way. And imposter syndrome is basically, you know, thinking that you're not good enough or that your achievements, you know, you're not deserving of your achievements. Um, and it does seem to occur more frequently in women than in men, largely due to the inherent biases that we are raised with. So whether we, we consciously know it or not, you know, most of us have been raised with the biases of um, that women are not as smart, that we are not as important, um, not as valuable as men. We're raised with this expectation that we should have be able to have a successful career and raise happy children and have a thriving personal life. And if we don't manage to do all these things that we're going to let that we're letting ourselves down and that we're not good enough. Mm. Um, so, you know, when and, and as part of that, we're also led to believe that if we ask for help, that that is a sign of either weakness or failure, that we should be able to do all of these things um, by ourselves. And so as women have taken on, um, you know, more stronger careers or better careers, advance their careers, there hasn't necessarily been that adjustment factor in terms of how do you manage, you know, everything else that a woman has been doing prior to having a career um, alongside of that. Uh, so in terms of, but in terms of imposter syndrome and, and confidence, I think there are two things that can really help. Um, one is to know that any level of self-doubt is normal, mm. right? So one of the things when, when we feel that we have imposter syndrome and we're in the grips of it is that it can be really, um, it can produce a lot of anxiety and it can feel like, you know, this is a real thing. Like I, I am my thoughts. I, I am not this this person. Um, so reminding yourself that having a little bit of doubt um, is normal and that that doubt is just your thoughts and, and not actually who you are or, or a reflection of who you are. And I think the second thing is to really become aware of what you're allowing yourself to think, um, whether that's about yourself, about what others are thinking of you, um, about your accomplishments or what you're actually doing, you know, all of that. Because what you allow yourself to think will directly impact how you feel about yourself. Mm. And the good news is that you get to decide what you want to think about yourself, right? So no one else has any control over that except for you. Um, so I think it's really important to first become aware of your thoughts and then remember that you are in control of choosing them. And, and that's a lovely sort of place to kind of bring this conversation to a close. And I'll come round and, and ask you all sort of for your final thoughts, if I may. But on that sort of you know mental health and well-being, that is um, that dictates really what we think, what we feel, and how we behave. So you know, as as people, we we all want to be seen, heard and valued and that really is at the heart of positive mental health and, and well-being when people feel sort of comfortable being themselves they truly feel that sense of belonging and from there they can go on um, and thrive 
So yes, this sense of belonging that we've talked about is at the heart of this conversation around inclusion, whether that's uh, uh, um, you know around gender or just creating generally inclusive workplaces. So I'd love to hear your final thoughts from each of you, kind of one thing that we can all do to help influence change and create a more equitable and inclusive work force particularly you know perhaps if you're thinking about future generations your all your um your young um uh, future uh, female leaders love to hear from you all Niru if I can come to you first please ah so one thing um you know what I'd just say slow down don't feel guilty for not taking everything on you know if I look at my daughter so of course they're in this age you want to try everything out but then I've even seen in this early age where she says, oh, but if I skip piano, are you going to be, are you going to be like, not really happy? Like their expectations set in their head, right? That there's a certain way to be perfect, just like women leaders or when you're in a workplace. So I think, um, I think Mickey and you have brought up many good points that it's just, it's again, like, yes, belongingness, but first of all, figure out who you are yourself, you know, and be happy with it. And that's why I think stuff like mental health and, you know, I, I've started to go back into my yoga as well. And it's just about, you know, just close off everything. And I think it's so important, figure for yourself out first. It's, you're sitting on a plane, they tell you, if we have a crash landing, make sure you put the mask on first before you help others. If you can't be happy with who you are, now your achievement, then you don't have to have, you know, looking at these women leader, you know, she achieved this at this age, she's at this board at that, that's great for her and that's there, you know, uh, that makes them happy. But I think it's very important you figure out where your happy state is, um, which is a mixture of the workplace and what you do at home, or if you like to go out and have a dance or you would like cooking, you know, take that all and then also slow down, enjoy. And I think that will naturally create a very positive environment around you and others and workplace. So that's what I would. Lovely. And Yurata? I would say it all starts from very early age and I think it's our role to talk about it with other females and grow their self-confidence uh, from very early age and not to let uh, gender define their abilities um, because it's only what you are capable of doing and what you're happy doing defines yourself rather than are you female, male, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and that's what I'm doing with my daughter. And, and that's what I'm telling to the, the young females I'm mentoring is uh, trust yourself and don't let gender to define who you are uh, or feel worse uh, just because of um, you are female. Thank you. And Mickey. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, as Nira and Yurata said, it is about nurturing the self-confidence from a very early age and being um, a role model as, as females, but also being aware that we still, as a role model, we still display a lot of the inherent biases that we ourselves were raised with. And so we do have to continue the conversation so that they're not only looking at us, but also hearing us um, because our lives don't necessarily embody all that is possible for women in the future. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we can all do is start with questioning our own biases and beliefs. They are so heavily ingrained in us, even as women, that we, we are often so blind to them. Um, so it's, you know, when you're in a room and you're feeling uncomfortable and you're thinking it's not okay to be myself, how do I do that, right? Like what, what, like why, why am I, why am I thinking that? Thank you. Gosh, we've, we've, we've touched on so much here and it feels like we've only sort of scratched the surface. Um, but I'm very conscious uh, about time and I'd like to thank you all sincerely for sharing um, your experiences and, and your wisdom today. So thank you, Niru, Yurata, Miki. You know, um, it, it's important uh, to be having this conversation and, you know, awareness, yes, is, is, is the starting point um, 
for onward sort of positive action, but it, it's not enough. So uh, I know for one that I pledge to continue the, the conversation and to do what I can to champion and, and take responsibility for, for helping to um, to break down um, the, the bias in my circles of influence um, for, um, for each other and for our future generations. So thank you all um, so much for, for joining and for sharing. Um, and that brings us to the end. Our next webcast will um, be on the 6th of April. Details will be shared um, in, over the coming days. But in the meantime, thank you once again to, to Mickey, Yurata and Nehru.